chapter 6, and uh, we're going to look at, uh, again, continuation of the Sermon on the Mount and a message entitled, uh, Do Not Worry. Got a little uh, quote here from, uh, from Brad Pitt, and uh, he's not a missionary with Gospel Phrasia. He's a film guy. A few of you might recognize him. It's from an uh, a, a interview with him a few years ago, uh, and he's in, in the interview, he, uh, he was just talking about how he's uh, unsatisfied with the American dream and so forth and, uh, and what he thought about that. And uh, he said this, man, I know all these things are supposed to seem important to us, the car, the condo, our version of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting more of impudence and isolation and desperation and loneliness? If you ask me, I say, uh, toss all this. We've got to find something else. Because all I know is that at this point in time, we are heading for a dead end, a numbing of the soul, a complete atrophy of the spiritual being, and I don't want that. The uh, interviewer went on to say, so if we're headed towards this kind of existential dead end in society, what do you think should happen? And um, Brad Pitt replied, hey man, I don't have those answers yet. The emphasis now is on success and personal gain. Uh, I'm sitting in it. I'm telling you that's not it. I'm the guy who's got everything I know, but I'm telling you, once you've got everything, then you're just left with yourself. I said it before, I'll say it again, it doesn't help you sleep any better, and, when you, uh, and you don't wake up any better because of it. Uh, again, the illusion to most folks is they, they have never arrived there, they will never arrive there, but they think if they could and they did, then there would be some kind of satisfaction uh, in, in the end. But the people that are there, uh, usually typically have more problems than, than everybody else in terms of wealth and power and, and what the world deems as, uh, as success. And what Jesus has to say here uh, in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is that there is a direct connection between our spiritual life, our spiritual well-being, and material possessions. Uh, the title of the message is uh, Don't Worry. Because Jesus' emphasis is going to be, we can either have our lives focused on him or we will worry. And um, I have to tell you, I've worried a lot this week. <laughs> it's funny when you do a message like this and study about it all week, you kind of catch yourself uh, a little more frequently. And uh, so as I said in the first service... Um, I didn't have time to change all my main points to I should store up possessions in heaven. They're all still we, but uh, I'm kind of preaching this for myself. You're welcome to listen as we go through it this morning. <laughs> and if you get anything else out of it besides me, then, you know, it's all good. But the first point is we should store up possessions in, in heaven, and that's from verses 19 to 21. Again, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, and again, just in terms of, you know, when you read the Bible, do basic observation. You've got a phrase repeated a couple of times. You might notice the do not, do not store up for yourselves, do not worry. And then there's another one in... Um, the beginning of chapter 7. Uh, and with that, then you look for a contrasting statement, the but. Rather than then do this, do this in contrast do that, to that. And in both times when it says do not, uh, it's a command by Jesus in the Greek that says, stop doing this because I know that you're doing this. <laughs> in other words, stop storing up for yourselves things here on earth because I know that you're doing this. But rather, Store up treasures in heaven, because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's an impossibility to live for the staff and live for God at the same time. 
uh, unless any of us think that uh, this is not a concern, they actually build buildings now just to hold the stuff because nobody's got room for all the stuff in their houses, right? And they're building more of those kind of buildings all the time. I mean, there's one next to Windward Mall. That's fairly prime real estate. But uh, that's okay <laughs> because we can make so much money storing the stuff from the people that can't hold the stuff in their houses. And, uh, but I know that no Christians actually have stuff there, you know. <laughs> because they're not really concerned about this stuff. Now, Jesus is talking to us here, and he's saying, I know that you're doing this, so stop it. That, that's what it says. It's a command when, it, when he says, do not store up for yourselves. Um, so again, several things about this. The first, uh, the possessions we store up will impact us uh, spiritually. And uh, Paul was very concerned about this. And as he's writing First Timothy uh, to his protege there in chapter 6, verse 6, he says, but godliness with contentment is, is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, uh, and gentleness. Again, godliness with contentment is great gain. The problem is not money itself. Take out a dollar bill. There's nothing moral about it. It's just a dollar bill. But the love of money, he says, is the root of all kinds of evil. Even believers, he says, have pursued it to the degree that they've left the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. So he says to Timothy, if you, if you get a chance, try doing this. No, he says, flee and pursue something else. Again, Paul's saying the same thing, Jesus. There's a direct connection between our spiritual well-being because where our treasure is, whatever we're pursuing in life, that's really where our heart, our mind, our thinking uh, are going to be as well. As they, you may have heard said many times, you can't take it with you. And uh, I remember hearing uh, Dr. Dobson on one of his shows one time said he was driving down uh, the street and, and because, the, you know, there's always the line of, you know, you never see a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it because you can't take it with you. And he saw a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. <laughs> He says, I'm going to have to follow it to find out what's going on here because you're, that's not supposed to happen. And he, he followed it all the way to, the, to the, uh, the cemetery and found out there were so many flowers they had to rent a U-Haul trailer and put them in the back. But you, you can't take it with you. Uh, the possessions we store up will impact us spiritually. So we're either storing them up here on earth or, or in heaven. Secondly, the possessions we store up on earth can be taken away by time and circumstances. And he gives several examples. The first one is uh, in the ancient world, uh, a garment that uh, would be highly esteemed would be one made of wool. But uh, that's also the type of garment where a moth could get in and, and eat holes in it. I don't know if you've ever had that, that, that happen. We've had that happen. It's kind of a bummer if it's a, a, a nice shirt or something. But uh, that was a concern. Uh, that type of garment would have been a status symbol to wear. If you wore that particular type of garment, people would have went, oh, well, you know, and it's a good thing we've kind of gotten over this thing of clothing and status symbols. But, you know, but in the ancient world, you know, I don't know what was up with those guys, but uh, wearing certain garments and so forth was actually a, a, a status symbol. And Jesus says those things are going to can be waste, uh, waste away because of moss. The second uh, example he gives or makes reference to is the idea where rust can come in. I have to tell you that uh, rust and WD-40 was not a big issue in the ancient world. Uh, it's really a reference, the term in the Greek is to grain. And uh, you could store up grain, which was a measure of wealth as well. But then you had to worry about uh, disease and decay and things like rats that would get in and destroy it. What you think is going to bring uh, status and security in your life, Jesus says, by time and circumstances, it can be taken away like that. And then the third one 
there's a concern that thieves could, uh, could rob you. And uh, I did this in the first service. I don't know if there was about half. I said, how many of you have had something stolen? <laughs> it was way over a third. It was almost uh, uh, half the people. But uh, uh, it can be the obvious. Uh, you know, Peter and Melissa had their car stolen in front of our house a few weeks ago. Things just go on. And when the policeman came, uh, he said, uh, did it have an alarm? And I said, no. He says, oh, if it had alarm, it would have taken them two to three minutes. No alarm, less than 60 seconds. You know, so, well, hey, that's really encouraging to run out and get an alarm. You know, if they want it, they're just going to take it kind of a thing. It's the culture we live in, yet we can pour so much into something, Jesus says, that we value. And it can be just taken like, like that. I don't know if you've noticed your, your 401k or your IRA state, RIA statements, but mine, somebody's taking it because I keep putting money in it. It keeps less and less every time I read that statement. But uh, I don't know what's going on. There can be the, you know, the whole issue of identity theft. We can be so concerned about our possessions, Jesus says, they can be stolen or taken. In Luke 12, verse 15, uh, Luke writes, uh, Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That would be a good bumper sticker, right? A life, because <laughs> we've kind of got the opposite in our, in our culture. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you've prepared for yourself. This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God, said Jesus. Again, uh, uh, there's a lot of the same teaching in Luke's gospel. Here he's teaching his disciples, the context there, he's teaching them in front of the Pharisees because the Pharisees loved their money and they loved to show it off. They thought it was a great status symbol of God's blessing to them, the external trappings and, uh, and so forth. And Jesus is trying to correct that thinking with his own guys as well as uh, with them. Uh, and says that we can store up and live for something that's going to, to pass away. Uh, the third thing, the possessions we store up in heaven will never be lost. And, um, and uh, as, as they will in, in this life. When, uh, when we go to another country, if you travel to another country, you'll have to at some point in time get there and, and exchange uh, some money. I had an interesting experience this last time we went to China. Uh, we exchange some money before we go, and then, uh, and then when we get there, as, as, t as the need arises, we exchange some more. I usually carry... Um, several hundred dollars on me, I get a, you know, several one hundred dollar bills and I carry them in a little uh, money belt kind of a thing and, and they, were, they were folded so that when I opened them up then they, they'd been pressed so much there was a little crease or a slight tear in the top of them. And because of that in China there's such a problem with uh, counterfeit money, no one would take those hundred dollar bills. I had several hundred dollars that were worthless <laughs> there. It was, it was a, real, a real thrilling prospect, uh, by the way. And, uh, and the whole point is I get there and what I thought, you know, would be valuable was not valuable because I couldn't exchange it. The same thing's going to happen one day when we get to heaven. See, we have an opportunity now to exchange our money for treasure in heaven. But we can't do it when we get there. We have to do it this side of heaven. Once we're there, it'll be, you've got gold and silver on earth. That's what we use for asphalt here, you know. If you haven't made the exchange, what you thought you had is going to be worthless on, on that day. It's what Jesus is saying here. Uh, again, this is how it will be for anyone who stores things up for himself but is not rich uh, for God. Again, Jesus speaks of this often in Luke's gospel, Luke 16, 1. Uh, he tells a, a very interesting story, a parable that has always kind of intrigued me because it seems like he's complimenting a guy for ripping people off, which that seems a little weird just on first reading, but uh, there's, there's something he's trying to teach us here. Luke 16, verse 1 and 2. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused 
uh, of wasting his possession. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account for your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. So I guess he's been kind of slothful or whatever, hasn't been doing a good job. So the manager, the owner calls him in and says, hey, buddy, you're fired. You know, I'm going to have to let you go because of what, uh, what you've been doing. You haven't been given a good account of yourself. Uh, and if you know the parable, then what the guy does then, uh, and apparently he was, the guy he was working for was in kind of a money lending business. Uh, if, if a Jewish person in this time loaned money to another Jewish person, how much interest could he charge? Zip. How much? <laughs> so apparently <laughs> what he's doing is not kosher, uh, literally. And, uh, and so this guy calls people in and he says, uh, how much do you owe my master? Oh, $5,000. Okay, I'm going to reduce that to 3000 You know, I'm going to raise 2000 off your bill. He calls another guy in. You know, how much do you owe my master? I owe him 15000 Okay, I'm going to cut that down to 7500 You only owe, oh, hey, thank you very much. And he, he does this with several people. Now, again, Jesus goes on, tells the parable, verse 8, we'll pick it up there. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwelling. Jesus seems to be commending this man in this fictitious story. And in one sense, what he's doing, he may have been erasing the interest that they were illegally being charged. So he may not have been really ripping the guy off uh, uh, at all. But at the same point, uh, the story is there because we understand that this guy realized something was going to change. He was going to lose his job and he was going to set himself up for what was going to happen in the future. That's the point. And Jesus says, in the same way, we should act shrewdly. Something's going to change. We're not always going to be here. We're not always going to be on this earth. So we should set ourselves up for what we know is going to come in the future. Because he says that in verse 9, use worldly wealth, again, money, possessions, whatever we have, to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, not the friends, but when the worldly wealth is gone, then you'll have treasure in terms of heaven, he says, in, in eternal dwellings. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we use right now, for example, investing in organizations like Gospel for Asia, if we do that now, we invest our worldly wealth now, then one day when we get to heaven, there's going to be our friends that greet us there and say, thank you for bringing the gospel to me. I got saved because of the missionary you supported, uh, and so forth. And the whole point is, that, is there going to be anybody in heaven that are our friends thanking us for what we did and the way that we shrewdly used our worldly wealth? That's the point of the story. It always intrigued me because of the <laughs> the guy who appears to be kind of dishonest. But Jesus is trying to make a, a, a point and see us a connection between our spiritual well-being, where we're going to spend eternity, what's going to happen in the future, versus how we use our, our possessions now. The fourth thing, he says, is the place where we store our possessions is an indication of the condition of our hearts. Do we really trust the Lord? Because where our treasure is, there's where our heart be also. What you invest in, the focus of your life and so forth, uh, where your treasure is, your time, your talent, your energy, as well as your finances, what you invest in constantly, that's really going to be where your heart's at. Actually, he'll go on to tell us you pretty much won't be able to control it. It's just going to happen. So we need to be very careful because we really want our hearts to be the Lord. I mean, that's what we sing. That's what we confess. We say our lives is the Lord. But he says, but if there isn't a, a physical connection to that in terms of how we handle finances and so forth, then in the end, that's not going to be where our hearts are at. So he says, we should store up our possessions in heaven. Now, secondly, we should share our possessions with others. And we see that in verses 22, 23. It's a little cryptic. I'll explain it uh, once we read it. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If uh, then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And to, <laughs> I've heard some very interesting explanations of this that uh, uh, have nothing to do with the text. It's just a Jewish idiom uh, and, and, uh, with, that says that if you are a generous person, you have a good eye. 
If you have an evil eye, it means you're a stingy person. Uh, and so here, again, it's the same context. It's just talking about, uh, you know, how do you view possessions? How do you view materialism and so forth? Let's give you a couple of examples. Jesus taught his guys in Hebrew, uh, so we don't really get it when it goes Greek and in, then into English. But if you go back in the Old Testament, we can see a couple of examples of it. Proverbs 22.9 uh, says in the NIV, A generous man will himself be blessed for he shares his food with the poor. But if you uh, take it from a New King James, which sticks a little more literal, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. Again, the good eye or the generous eye is that, you know, again, whether you're a generous person or not. Conversely, Proverbs 28, 22, again, the NIV, a stingy man is eager to get rich and is unaware that poverty awaits him. But when you go to a new King James, a little more literal, a man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. So Jesus here staying in the same context uh, and is really talking about when we share our possessions, our bodies are full of light. Conversely, when we do not share our possessions, it indicates that our body is full of darkness. Uh, the thief would say, what's yours is mine. The selfish man would say, what's mine is mine, I'll keep it. But the Christian should say, what's mine is a gift of God and I'll share it. And it's been a hallmark of, of Christianity from, from the first century on because of this teaching of Jesus. So we should store up our possessions in heaven, share our possessions with others. We should serve God and not our possessions. And uh, he gets very frank at this point in verse 24. Uh, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So he says you can't to serve two uh, masters. Of course, he doesn't really uh, understand the complicated society in which we live today, the uh, uh, vast economic resources that are at our, our disposal, the investment opportunities that are around. And certainly we can uh, do many things today and still, you know, have our hearts totally devoted to the Lord. No, he says, no, you can't. He says, you, you, he uses very contrasting terms. He says, you'll either hate one and love the other, you will despise one to be devoted to the other. This is not a lot of neutral ground here kind of a thing. Uh, obviously, uh, Jesus is very concerned about this. And, uh, and he's about ready now to launch into uh, this whole other idea, the second command. He's commanded us, don't store up your stuff here on earth, store it up in heaven, uh, because in the end, it's going to affect your spiritual life. Paul, again, writing to Timothy says, People that go after these things, build their lives around them, fall into many, many trials and pierce themselves through. They wander from the faith and so forth. And then Jesus tops it all off by saying, you'll end up hating one and loving the other. Um, of course, a lot of us don't have any money, so it's not an issue anyway. Amen? <laughs> Let's just say in theory it could be. <laughs> Hey, we've, we've still got our stuff. There's still more than we can get in the closet. We're trying to figure out what to do with it, though, right? Uh, this is all proportioned to, to whatever our income, our lifestyle is. It still uh, all applies. And uh, we need to be very, very careful. Uh, there's a mental and a spiritual bondage that we can fall into. Uh, money can serve us, or we can become uh, a servitude to, to the money. I want to read a couple of uh, uh, conditions that Larry Burkett uh, lays out to maybe determine uh, whether you're leading to a point where well, the money is just there, you can use it to, uh, at your disposal, you know, to care for your family, to be a good steward, to give to God and as the Holy Spirit would lead and so forth, or if you've become a servant, because uh, you're going to serve one or the other. Uh, a couple of things. One, uh, if you have overdue bills, uh, they're going to produce anxiety. So they're going to begin to affect you. And there's a certain amount of servitude that, that begins to come with that. Uh, it begins to, you know, kind of take up the thought life and what's happening there. We'll talk more about this whole issue of, of uh, worry in just a moment and anxiety. But it's, it's just a sign. Uh, if you worry about investments, then you're serving them. They're not serving you any, any longer. If you have a, a, a get-rich-quick attitude and, and attempt to gain wealth without work, your, your, think, your thinking is getting uh, uh, not biblical. 
and, uh, and so forth. And you're beginning to move towards a position of, of servitude, of coming under a different master. If you're lazy, that's not an attitude as Christians should have, uh, and therefore you don't see yourselves as having an obligation to go out and, uh, and work hard. Now, uh, the Bible tells us to go out and, and work hard. How, how many days a week? Six days a week. So if you got that extra day off, you're like semi-retired. But I go out and work, the Bible says six days a week, and then God will provide for you. It's not, the company may sign the check and give it to you, but it's God that's providing. We're not to sweat that. We're just to go out and, you know, uh, be faithful workers and then, and then trust the Lord. But if you're lazy, it's an indication there's something wrong with the way you view things, and you may end up in servitude uh, to money, wrong master. If you're deceitful, and again, our, our world believes that you cannot be honest and successful that you must be deceitful. And if you fall into that trap, you're, you're headed towards serving the wrong master. Uh, six, if you're greedy, if there's always a desire for more, then you're, you're, you're headed that way as well. And then lastly, seventhly, if you covet things, if you are into the, <laughs> the keep up with the Joneses, and we are bombarded with advertising constantly to tell us to be dissatisfied, right? So that we'll, we'll want more. You know, there's not a car advertisement that says, this car is really nice, it's the brand new one. The one you've got is probably just fine, though. If it's running good, keep it. You know, I mean, the, you don't, it's here if you want it. You don't really need it. That's not the way things are advertised, right? I mean, it's, you must be dissatisfied. Look what you could have, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and, and if we buy into that, and that whole world system, we're headed towards servitude where we could end up hating God and loving money. That's what Jesus said. We could end up despising one uh, and being devoted to the other one. So once we're in servitude, three things usually happen, Larry Burkett says. Uh, you begin to have unmet family needs. There's just, you're just not there like you were at one time. You begin to be overcommitted at work and you begin to be single-minded because now you think you can serve God in money and it begins to shift, and you're just, you're not serving God at all anymore, and you're on your road to, to servitude. So our material possessions will affect our spiritual life. We should store our possessions in heaven. We should share our possessions with others, be generous. We should serve God and not our possessions. And then fourthly, and I think it's where uh, it all ties together, we should seek first the kingdom. We see that in verse 25 and 34. Uh, 30, excuse me, 25 to 34, and the tip-off is the first word, therefore, which means because of this, because of everything Jesus said, then do this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry, another command, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe, clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He had to throw that in. <laughs> Each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay, got enough problems. Don't really have to worry about tomorrow. But uh, let's go through this. I think it's. Uh, uh, I think it's very, very good. Uh, I'm hoping it's helping me <laughs> with my worries. That Jesus is saying, stop doing that too. And he's saying, stop doing that because of what I just said. Because this is what could happen to you if you continue down that road. So uh, very, very important. How do we overcome worry? Well, first, if we seek first the kingdom, then we won't have to worry about ourselves. I think that's the main thing. And then he gives several illustrations. The first one is in the wording. We should not worry because it's a distraction. That's what the, the term in the Greek means. Worry means distraction. 
uh, distraction leads us to anxiety. And I want to give you a couple of passages that might help clarify this one. The first one is in Luke 10, 38. Very familiar story. Martha and Mary, uh, Jesus has come in. And you know the story. We have a tendency to focus on Mary uh, because she's the one that's at Jesus' feet. She's chosen the better way. Listen to the wording, though. As Jesus was and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She's the owner of the house. Not Lazarus, not Mary. Martha owned the home. She must be a pretty successful gal. She's, she's, in, she's a businesswoman. She's involved in the affairs of the world. That's great. You know, one of the early foundings of the, of the church in Europe was a gal named Lydia who was a very successful businesswoman and pretty much opened the door for the, for the gospel and the apostle Paul. That's not the issue. That's not the problem. But just, just to note, this is, this is where Martha is at. Verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. That's our word, worry or anxious. She was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Worry, anxiety, is a distraction away from the Lord. You notice that when you're, you're just worshiping the Lord and you're totally into it, you're not exactly filled with anxiety and worry at that moment. If you are, you're not really worshiping, right? I mean, these, these two things don't, don't coexist together. Uh, and I think that uh, maybe this helps us understand what is wrong with a life that's focused on, on materialism. And again, very prevalent in the Western culture. Can you understand why that during the Jesus people revival, young people turned in the droves to faith in Jesus Christ? Because their first premise in life was, there's got to be some kind of love for me somewhere. We want to be the love generation. And two, we have absolutely rejected materialism because we see it's bankrupt and doesn't bring any satisfaction. That was the premise of the hippie movement. Can you see how the gospel would appeal to that? They come in and say, Jesus rejects all materialism. Keep talking. And he has a love that is unconditional, and he'll meet you right where you're at. I think I'm interested. And we had, we had a whole generation uh, that came to faith in Christ because they, they, they had already been preconditioned to get this. <laughs> That's not the same anymore. <laughs> the current generation, by the way, they're kind of into stuff. You know, the latest video games, the iPod, this gadget, that gadget. I mean, you know, when you look at the majors and that are, guys are doing in school, th there's nothing wrong with that. Some of you just graduated. God bless you. Go out and make a lot of money. Be rich towards God. You know, uh, the issue is, is not the stuff. It's what you do with the stuff because it can really harm us and plague our heart and lead to worry. Now, I know that most of you, that's not an issue. It's just me. But uh, let me just go on for myself here <laughs> as we worry. Worry is a distraction. Uh, it takes us away from the Lord. That's, that's Jesus' concern here. Uh, another verse for you, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. That's our same, same word that Jesus is using. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, I don't like that part, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul uh, saying, do not be anxious, do not be distracted, uh, do not worry. Rather, pray. You know, come to the Lord uh, with praise, uh, with thanksgiving. Rather than thinking on those things that you're worried about, uh, and there's enough, Jesus said, there's enough in one day. You don't even have to look ahead to the next day. Uh, it's, it's almost like you don't even want to know what's coming up next. <laughs> uh, rather than do that, turn towards, towards God. I think there's some very practical advice here. It's a distraction. We need to kind of refocus our thoughts upon the Lord when it comes. Two, we should seek first the kingdom and not worry because life is more important than food and clothing. And when you think about it, we can uh, really get caught up into worrying about some things that aren't worth it. <laughs> they, you, know, you know, most of the stuff we worry about never happens. I think it's like 90%. And the 10% that does happen, we should have worried about. We weren't aware of it anyway, so it didn't do us any good, even if we knew it was coming, you know, uh, we, which we didn't. I, uh, the whole point here is Jesus is saying you shouldn't worry 
uh, because uh, you have a tendency to think that food and clothing, possessions, status symbols, all these things out here, somehow that brings value. That's what makes you valuable as a person. And he says, that's not true. You're created in my image. I am your heavenly father. That's what makes you valuable. But we have a, a world system that says that's not true. That says you're, you're, you're here because of a set of, of random chance actions that led to your being here. You have no purpose, no meaning. You're mud and you know, do the best you can with what you got kind of a thing. Uh, that's what we, again, in the Truth Project, we call the cosmic battle. These two different worldviews. Uh, and, uh, and it's so easy to, to buy into it. And I, I told this illustration uh, once before, but I think it's appropriate. I, I, uh, when I used to take the kids to school in the morning when they were in high school and drop them off, and, and it's always the same parents arriving about the same time. It was a fairly small school, and I knew a lot of the, a lot of the parents because from coaching volleyball, I'd coach their kids, and one of the dads would usually pull up next to me. We'd shoot the breeze a little bit and everything. And uh, he, he had a car that was more rusty than my car. I mean, it had big holes in it. Not like mine had like fist size holes, but he has big holes. And uh, it was, this is definitely a beach car and, and everything. And anyway, we, to, we became friends. We'd shoot the breeze a little bit and talk about the kids and stuff. Go on our day. Well, one day he pulled in the parking lot in this brand new, really nice SUV. It was really nice. And, uh, uh, and I... And I told him, wow, that's a nice car. He go, oh, yeah, I finally got a decent car and everything. We talked about that and stuff. And then it, it occurred to me, uh, I'm, I believe it was the Holy Spirit, just saying, if he had driven that car the first day, the first day you met him, would you view him differently as a person? I think I would have. I would have given, elevated him, given him a different status because of the car that he drove. That's, do you do that with people? I mean, I, I, mean I, I get busted on this uh, just all the time. Is the guy that flips hamburgers down at that Burger King right now, is he as valuable as, as anybody that's a president of a corporation in the state of Hawaii? Is he, is he as valuable as, as Governor Lingle, holds the whole, highest government official? In God's sight, he or she is. Absolutely. See, but there's a world system that says value to a person is based on their stuff. And who they are. And God says that's not true. And, and we get worried because we, we take on that attitude that's, that's, not, that's not God's. It's, the, it's an attitude of the world that is anti-Christ. It's against Christ. And, and Jesus says we need to be very careful. Because it will bring worry. It will bring anxiety if we buy into it. So he says be careful. The third thing, we should seek first the kingdom, not worry, because our heavenly Father cares for us. And again, Jesus uses a very typical rabbinical uh, argument where he argues from the lesser to the greater. Uh, you're in the image of God. Uh, God is our heavenly Father. So as an illustration, he chooses a bird. He chooses grass. He's arguing from the lesser or greater. If this is true in this lesser degree, then how true is it in, the, in reality of, uh, of what he's trying to illustrate? Verse 26, look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Now here it is. Are you not much more valuable than they? That's, that's the issue, right? If we see our value in God's sight, we're not going to worry as much about things because we know he values us. He cares for the birds. He cares uh, for the flowers. Again, this idea is the opposite of the way the world thinks. The world believes, in fact, that the birds are more valuable than you are. Point in case, illustration. It's kind of comical. It's sad at the same time. If you were to come across somewhere on the mainland a nest of bald eagles, which are uh, an endangered species, if you were to somehow take or break one of those eggs, it would cost you $1,000 and possibly six months in jail. Why? Because it's an endangered species, and everybody knows that in that egg is life. And if you destroy it, that, that little bird will never come forth, our government says. And that's true. And we need to be careful about our environment. At the same time, our government will pay for an abortion to take the life of a child in its mother's womb because it's only tissue. Now the egg, that's life in there, right? 
but inside the mother, that's, that's just a tissue. It really hasn't developed enough to call it a child or a baby or a life yet. And, and the world says that the birds are more valuable than you. And God says, no, they're not. I created them. I created them to show my power and display my creativity and, and so forth. But you are my child. And if I will care for one of them, the lesser, how much greater will I care for you? There's a condition. If you will seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then I'll do this. It's a conditional promise, but it is a promise and one that you can bank on. And we can either do that or worry. So we can believe a world system that distracts us, causes us to worry, and takes our attention off eternal things, or it gets us to devalue ourselves and not see us the way God does or devalue others. That'll create worry as well. And then again, four, we're to seek first the kingdom and not worry because our heavenly father knows our needs. Verse 30, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and, and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? We shouldn't worry about it because we're valuable to God. He cares for us, and he knows our needs. He knows our needs even before we, we ask. And, uh, and it's easy to lose sight of that. And then fifthly, we should seek first the kingdom of God and not worry because we can trust our heavenly father. We get that from the, the line in verse 30 as he says this. He sends by saying, oh, you of little faith. And that's really the issue, isn't it? <laughs> it's really a faith issue. You know, you know why, why pray when you can worry? <laughs> you know, you know but, but Jesus says, you can trust your heavenly father. He's your heavenly father. He created you. He's watching over you. He cares. If he cares for the birds, how much more will he care for you? He knows what you need even before you ask. And, and really, it's always a question, do we really believe what we say we believe? If we do, then you'll stop worrying with me. <laughs> but it's a, it's a tough thing, right? It's an issue. Uh, nobody's under the delusion that we're going to kind of kind of get it and walk out on the heavenly cloud. I'll never worry again. Uh, but what I'm saying is that when it does come and it will come, Jesus says, in, in fact, there's so much. There's enough for today. Don't even worry about tomorrow. Uh, he wants us to bring these verses and these illustrations back to our, to our own minds and go, yes, you do love me. Yes, you do care for me. You are watching over me. So I'm going to cast my anxiety, Peter says, on you because of the fact that you do care for me. Let's go to 4B. If we seek first the kingdom, then all these things will be given to us as well. So this is the, this is the plus of it. If I refuse to have the anxiety and buy into a world system that devalues people, and I really see us as made in the image of God, having a relationship with a heavenly father who knows us, who cares for us, and, uh, and promises that if we'll seek him first and his kingdom first, he'll meet every need that we, that we have. Uh, then on top of it, uh, it's all these things as, as well. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 25, kind of a classic verse. I was young and now I am old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children uh, begging bread. I think the idea of, again, it's if you do this and all these needs will be met, I think it goes well, way beyond food and clothing and, uh, and shelter. Uh, I think it's the, uh, the issues of life. Uh, you're worried about having a husband or a wife some one day? I would say seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You would like to have a home someday, and that's important to you? Tell the Lord, and then seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I'm not preaching a health and wealth gospel. I'm just telling you, Jesus says, if you'll just kind of seek very hard after me and make me the most important things, uh, and, and not possessions, if you'll be rich towards God uh, and, and store things in heaven, because there's no, no money exchange outside the pearly gates, if you'll not be caught up into a world system that is totally materialistic and, a, and robs you of your spiritual vitality, and if you'll seek me first, he says, step back and watch what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you. Uh, this is, uh, again, the words of Jesus. Uh, it's a promise. And uh, really, it's one that, uh, 
uh, Kathy and I have really staked our, our lives on for years, and we've never, never been, been disappointed in it. Uh, seeking first the kingdom of God. It's way beyond just your, your finances. You know, it's really a, never a convenient time to serve the Lord. I'll just tell you that. You know, if you're waiting for like a really convenient time to just kind of jump in and serve the Lord, it ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen, you know. When, it, when I was first asked to teach a Bible study, which is still an amazing thing to me, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, we had a, a three-month-old. Melissa was three months old, and we were both self-employed. That, that's not a good time to jump in and, you know, find some more. You know, we're like working six and a half days a week, you know, because we go to dinner at Grandma's on Sunday night. That was our little, little break in the action. And uh, so to take some of that time, and so that's... That's time I'm not in my shop. And I kept looking for those minahunis, but they never came. And, uh, and if I wasn't in there, it ain't when nothing happening. So to take time to study the word meant like taking a pay cut, right? If you're self-employed, <laughs> the self-employed guys understand. Hey, then what am I doing? Well, Lord, I believe you give me the opportunity you call me. I'm, I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do this. Notice my phrasing. And then I'm just going to trust you on the other end. And somehow it all adds up at the end of the month. And what I've always found out is that it does. It, it, it always does. I just want to uh, close with uh, uh, a great story of uh, David Livingston. David Livingston was a missionary in uh, Africa from 1840 to 1873. And, and uh, if you haven't ever read a little, even a little biography about him, it's... Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's great. It's great. I mean, this guy's life was, uh, it was so committed to the Lord, it's so much sacrifice and, uh, and all. And those were the days that, uh, you know, he'd kind of go uh, with his wife and the kids would have to stay back in London and attend school. I mean, long periods of time away from the family and sending his wife back, months of separation. When she finally came and joined them, she, she ends up uh, getting uh, some kind of a sickness and, and dies and so forth. So it was a life of hardship, but he was so committed to the gospel and, and, to, uh, and to Africa that at the end of his life, when he died, uh, they wanted to send his body back to Scotland to be buried. But the African said, that's fine, but let us cut his heart out because we're going to bury it here because his heart was for Africa. That's what they did. David Livingston's heart is buried in Africa, but the rest of his body was sent back to Scotland. There was a point in time where he wanted to get the gospel into Central Africa. It had never gone there. And uh, he was told that there was a little custom that he would have to go through where he would meet with the, the tribal chief, not the chief of one of the villages, but the one that was over all of them. Uh, and at such time, he would have to lay out all of his material possessions. That's what we're talking about, right? He had to lay out all of his material possessions. Well, he didn't have a lot. You know, I mean, he had his Bible, he had a couple books, his glasses, some paper, some pens, his medical, a little bit of medical equipment that he had with him. He was a medical doctor, and he had a goat because he had stomach problems and always had problems with uh, drinking the local water and everything. So he actually took his uh, little refrigerator with him, the goat, uh, so he could always have a supply of something, uh, the goat milk. So he had to lay it all out, and then this chief would choose whatever he wanted and then give him a gift in return. And so... He had his translator. They had this little ceremony. He lays it all out. And, the, and the, uh, the, tr the tribal chief chooses the goat kind of figures, you know. And uh, David Livingston was, was bummed out and complaining to God. I knew that would happen. You know, it's like I need that, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, and then the translator came over to him and, and said this. And I have the quote for you. He says, uh, because he gave him this little walking staff. He says, that's not a walking cane. It's the king's very own scepter. With it, you will find entrance to every village in our country. The king has honored you greatly. And it was. With that scepter, he could walk into any village and just show it. Oh, and they just come right in. Do whatever you want. Say whatever you want. We'll gather around. It was, it was, it was what he needed to, to it like pave the way to get the gospel into Central Africa because of that little act of laying his possessions out. <laughs> he didn't have many either. And just saying, Lord, okay, I'm going to do this and let this guy take whatever he wanted. It opened the gospel to Central Africa. Every missionary that came after David Livingston came down the pathway of his sacrifice in terms of giving up his goat <laughs> so that thousands could hear the gospel. You know, on this side of things, we go, 
give me a break. It was just a goat, man. Look what it, he didn't know. See, we don't know on this side either. That's the whole point. But Jesus says, apparently, when we get to heaven someday, we're going to look back the other side and say, I gave up what? So that you could do what? Oh, my goodness. Now I really get it. And he, he's trying to teach us his boys there on the side of the hill, the Sermon on the Mount, all these things that we really don't want to hear because he knows how to push our buttons and says, look at what you value but, and be careful because there's a world system that will suck you in. But if you'll seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, you know what? All the stuff you're really concerned about, I'll give it to you anyway. But you know what happens when that happens? Like, like when the, when the, the stuff kind of comes your way, it's only stuff and you go, Praise the Lord. That was totally the Lord because I wasn't even like trying to do that or accomplish that or get that or have that and God gave it to me anyway. Praise the Lord. God gets the glory, God gets the glory for it as opposed to, do you know what I accomplished? I've worked very hard for this, you know. If it wasn't for my skill and determination and talents and abilities, I would have never achieved what I've achieved. But oh, and praise God, you know, I think he helped me a little along the way. See, it's, it's one or the other. But the scary thing, Jesus says, you could end up hating one and loving the other. He doesn't say if, he says you will. You can be devoted to one or despise the other. We need to be careful what we're aligning our life with. One last quote from, uh, from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world uh, <clears throat> were just those who thought most of the next he says, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you'll get neither. Good words. Let 
Yeah. Uh -huh. 